Hello and welcome to Eat Sleep Code, the official Telerik podcast. I'm your host, Ed Charbonneau, and with me today is John Bristow, my co-host for the week. How you doing, John? I'm good. Uh, is that exciting yeah. enough? Is that a good intro? Sure, sure. Let's go with it. <laughs> Uh, so Slack got a brand new redesign this week, John. Yes. Have you loaded this up and checked it out yet? Uh, it's not available for me yet. It is rolling out. Uh, they announced it yesterday. And so, uh, it's, it's interesting because a lot of folks are saying it's a looking like teams, you know, sort of thing. <laughs> so, uh, for those who, do, for those who use teams, don't worry. This is a, a team's equivalent. Uh, if you haven't used Slack. Slack is um, obviously owned by the folks over at Salesforce, and uh, obviously there this is a pretty competitive space. I mean, there's a lot of solutions out there. There's uh, Slack, there's Teams, there's Mattered Most, there's Discord, um, and they all cater to different audiences. Slack is pretty popular for various organizations, just like Teams is. Although, you know, historically on this show, we've talked a lot about the adoption rates, and Teams is kind of hockey sticked a little bit. Anyway, so um, Slack is introducing a new sort of UX update, and uh, a lot of folks are saying it looks like Teams, but the one thing that I find with Slack, because we use Slack a lot, uh, is that it's often overwhelming with the amount of channels and the amount of Slacks that you're a member of, and so hopefully this will make it easier for folks to navigate. I am in encouraged by the fact that they obviously see this as a challenge. Um, I am often overwhelmed by the number of channels I'm a member of. And so hopefully this will help me. Um, there are features of Slack that I don't use that I hope will maybe bring it a little bit more present. Um, huddles are an example of that. Huddles are like inline sort of conversations you can have over audio. And uh, too often it's it's difficult for folks to know that it actually exists. Um, so hopefully these changes will add some capabilities to Slack that will make it easier. But yeah, so Slack's getting a, a pretty big significant overhaul and this will be rolling out over the next, I guess, weeks slash months that's what i saw on twitter so yeah huddles is is interesting and worth checking out it's like they streamlined the audio call part of, yeah uh, yeah pretty much the, the ui and i think the first time i tried it uh and i'm mentioning this because they've updated it recently um the first time i tried it i was in with a co-worker and i was like well let's just share a screen and like there was no screen share in huddles. no <laughs> Nope. But uh, if you look at the animation they have here, it looks like they've added um, the screen share capability. Yeah, maybe they've that. maybe they've expanded that. So there you go. Yeah. So if you watch right here when they highlight over the huddles portion, you can see the screen share icon. So I'm I probably need to revisit that. Uh, Sam and I both use that feature every once in a while to hmm. uh, get on the same page about a meeting that's coming up or a stream we're about to do. So. Mm -hmm. yeah, check that out. I haven't gotten the update either yet, so I haven't got to look at this. Yeah, it'll be rolling out. So I can't imagine like if people are comparing it to Slack. I mean, they're they're essentially the same. You know, they they are for the same purpose. Yep. So I wouldn't see like why that would be such an issue. Like they're, they're for me, the look... the real the real power with Slack is workflows. So we use workflows quite heavily, and it's from a messaging perspective people are now so there's a there's a ui component layer to slack called block kit which allows you to construct these interactive bi-directional type conversations that are can be automated so you can drive a lot of your um automations um or semi-automations if you will like a button for example like oh yeah mark that as re mark that as complete in my back end crm or something oh, cool. Yeah, so it's it's all about staying within the tool. And so Slack is becoming sort of that one-stop shop for everything that can be driven through back-end workflows. And so whether you utilize the workflow capability directly in Slack or you underpin this with a workflow tool, that is, I think, the low-code solution that I think a lot of people are using these days. And I know what developers are thinking. I know developers listening to me talk right now talk about low-code and, and start rolling their eyes. Um, it is worth no looking at. I mean, if you're looking at workflow yeah. solutions like ops, like if you're looking for like something like Workato or Zapier or something like that that underpins uh, integration with a backend, you'd be surprised how much you can get done. Like you can wire up, stitch together systems quite quickly, and then use Slack or Teams or something like that as the sort of front end UI for um, collaboration. That's interesting. I haven't thought of that before. We don't we don't use it that way. We're 
Yeah, we totally use it that way. It makes yeah. it makes it makes it really easy just to click a click a button that says, "Oh yeah, I talked to that customer," or "Yep, mark that as complete in the back end system," or you know, X, Y, or Z. Nice. Uh, we talked about uh, Stack Overflow a little bit last week. We did. Yep. Yeah. Talked about their AI initiative and some other stuff. Uh, this is a blog post of theirs about the insight into their traffic. Yeah, so we, we about... talked a little bit about how uh, AI is disrupting Stack Overflow's traffic. There was a post on, <laughs> they, they talk about it in the first sentence, over the last few weeks, we've seen inaccurate data and graphs circulating on social media. Um, so they're saying here that uh, that data is inaccurate, which is fair. I mean, that's totally within, that's a reasonable ex response I would see from from the folks over there. Um, they're saying that they're, they're we, we so the post that I was referring to, or we re we referred to, was one that was on Twitter, where they were claiming that it was up to thirty percent uh, um, decline on terms of traffic. They're saying it's about five percent, and they talk a little bit about hey uh, AI. Um, so they they're basically saying, listen, it's not as it's not as large as people are claiming. However, AI is having a disruption. That is true. Um, and we're trying to respond to it through Overflow AI. So Overflow AI is, as we talked about in the last show, is um, Stack Overflow's sort of um, LLM, uh, lar large language model for generative uh, responses, for search um, integrated inside of Slack and Teams and VS Code and all sorts of goodness. I think Teams is one of them. It's definitely in um, VS Code. So yeah, uh, definitely interesting in terms of what's going on there. Docker Desktop 4.22 Resource Saver Compose Include an Enhanced RBAC Functionality. I'm not a DevOps person. That meant nothing. <laughs> you don't have to be a <laughs> DevOps person. So uh, Docker Docker is obviously the uh, solution used by a lot of folks for uh, container hosting, etc. Very popular with developers. And so 4.22 is available. As they claim here, it's a new resource saver feature that massively reduces idle memory and CPU utilization. Uh, Docker Compose, which is the tool that you'll use, it's a CLI that you'll use for uh, generative, uh, for generative, for generating, I'm getting my AI terms mixed up, for generating um, or composing um, images. And so you'll utilize that for, for various roles. And um, so, yeah, there's a number of features here, minor updates relative to that. But um, yeah, Resource Saver is the, I guess, the big one that's been touted. So as uh, you rightly point out here, um, this is uh, detects when Docker desktop is not running containers and massively reduces its memory and CPU utilization or footprint. So that's a welcome, welcome change because um, anyone who's run Docker will know that your system does start to slow down if you run too many containers. <laughs> so uh, this will be uh, this will be awesome to have. Anybody that's used a container or a VM knows how resource intensive these things can be. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah, just a variety of uh, changes there. RBAC obviously is another change that's coming. That's role based, um, uh, basically security. So if you're wanting to delegate uh, roles, uh, you can do that. That's available on an organizational basis. So RBAC is a big thing, I think, for a lot of a lot of groups that are out there. Uh, we utilize RBAC quite extensively across GitHub. Um, so yeah. And uh, what have you folks been up to over there at Octopus Deploy? Oh, we've been busy. We haven't been doing anything. Yet. No, we've been just sitting on our hands. <laughs> no, um, no, we've been busy. Um, this is an article written by Sean Cessna, who's a member of my team. Um, this is entitled "How to Deploy Azure Container Apps." So we've been adding more and more capabilities around containers. And so we've got some new um, steps available that you can use to deploy Azure container apps. And this blog post walks through basically soup to nuts, everything you're going, you know, everything in terms of creating um, container apps in Azure and then utilizing that as uh, a basis for deployment. And so we have some new steps that are available uh, in, that have been written for the community library, and these can be used to deploy directly to Azure if you so wish. Um, so yeah, our step library is I think 512 steps now available or 522, somewhere around there. And so yeah, um, this is a way in which you can now do deployments via Octopus if you so wish. The powerful thing is here, it's like, it's you know people would say, well, who cares? I can deploy using the CLI. It's like, yes, you can, but 
the the powerful thing here with octopus is you can use this as an orchestration tool for your deployments basically so you can't orchestrate a cli without scripts and you don't want to run those yourself plus good luck getting variables in change and uh, things like that so yeah. all the stuff that we build like concepts like environments or tenants etc those are the things that we offer um, in terms of octopus so it is a a sort of tool for doing all that uh, Lily's just dropping by. Lily's part of our team at Progress. Just saying hello and have a good stream. Uh, welcome. <laughs> welcome, Lily. Nice to have our folks dropping in on us. Um, I also noticed you use the eShop on web application um, as part of this tutorial. And uh, this, is, this is actually something pretty helpful that I use for an upcoming workshop. So okay. uh, I wasn't planning on mentioning it, but now that I, I saw that, it does remind me if you go to Telerik.com, if I can type today, uh, and uh, there's a banner right here that'll pop out on the left-hand side if you want to register for it, or you can go to Telerik.com slash webinars. Um, they are up at the top here. We've got a modernization workshop that um, uh, Jeff Fritz and I are doing on September 13th. Nice. We use that same eShop, and we migrate that from uh, ASP.NET and web forms to .NET 7. And, and you're doing this in an hour? Believe it or not, yes. So Good luck. There's, there's some <laughs> tools here that help us with this. Um, so the, there's uh, the Migration Assistant, if you yes. haven't checked that out. I mean, it's going to do a pretty good part of the lifting for you. Um, and then uh, the Telerik UI for Blazor on the other end to rewrite all of the views into Blazor uh, with some scaffolding. So it's uh, now it's not going to be in an hour. It's it's in an afternoon. Um, oh, I see. Sorry. <laughs> it's not a webinar. It's a workshop. So from nine a.m. It's like the next, 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 next finish workshop. There you go. Yeah. So a couple hours. A couple hours. All to right. Get this done. Yeah, you guys got a pretty good looking lineup there. So you've got a bunch of stuff happening in September, which is awesome, and. Huh? Uh, yeah, we've got a couple of webinars coming up ourselves. Um, same URL, it's octopus.com slash webinars. So, um, yeah, so <laughs> this is like the, no, you spelled it wrong. There's an O. I really did. Octo, and then, yep, yeah, there you go. So we've got a couple of webinars coming up very soon. Uh, we've got Guestline, uh, who's a customer of ours, talking about uh, how they're using Octopus Deploy, and then uh, I got the folks over at Clear Measure, and then at the we haven't put this up yet, but we're gonna have our community town hall um, at the end of the month as well. So, hello to the folks in chat. Make sure you jump on some of those webinars, free content. I mean, what you know, working ask for, do lunch and learn, whatever it is. We're we're trying to do as much as we can. I don't know about you guys, but like we're just trying to do is we're trying to up the cadence basically as much as we can. That's that's all we want to do is just tell people more and more and more, and then jump in on any webinar you want. So you give people options. Um, you can you can listen to how a customer does something, or you can learn something at a one on one sort of seminar, etc. So like, you know you're trying to give people the, the things that they want. I think that's what what matters most. Somehow the two of us got like super fortunate and we've got these great people that want to join us on these things. So you got Jeffrey Palermo yeah, joining you. Uh, yeah. And then I've got Jeff Fritz. They're both Jeffs, by the way. But anyway, <laughs> Jeff Fritz is joining me. So, you know, you're only as good as the company you keep. So. Oh, that, what does that say take, about us? <laughs> take, that, take that either way. Take yeah, I know. Like. Two, two yahoos. Two yahoos talking about tech. Uh, speaking of uh, Microsoft technology. Um, I was referencing my, my Blazor workshop there, by the way. Uh, Microsoft stuff. Visual Studio 2022 17.8 Preview 1 has arrived. Yeah, so 17.7 is now available. And so 17. In, in classic sort of fashion, 17.8 Preview 1 is now available. So this is a, a new approach that, well, not new, but it's approach that Microsoft takes is like, as soon as you put the update out, put the new one up, you know, so um, 17.8. Eight uh, is adding some capabilities around these key areas you see here. So if you're running Visual Studio, uh, which a lot of folks are, um, this is some of the things that they're looking at. So this is based on votes. So you can see add reviewers to your PRs is one of the top getting votes. Uh, case preserving find and replace, which is awesome. Um, and then in C++ game development, uh, build insights, functional view. 
And then I don't think they list any other votes in any other topics. But you can see some of the things that they'll be working on for 17.8 Preview 1. Uh, Scott from chat was asking, like, what type of news do we cover? Uh, we, <laughs> everything. Uh, yeah, we, we cover everything on the show. Uh, we we do... might lean a little Microsoft heavy from time to time because it's that's from time time, yeah. uh, my background. And, um, you know, John's done .NET stuff in the past. And well, I also well worked at Microsoft a lot. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, whatever. If you, you know, <laughs> if you want to just throw that out there, John, humble brag. I'm just oh, come on. It's not a humble brag. Saying, yeah, yeah. It's 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 definitely uh, a nice uh, part of your resume. Definitely. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I've done .NET dev for 20 years, too. So uh, we do a little bit of heavy .NET stuff, but we talk about JavaScript, HTML, CSS, Go, Rust, you name it. And if, if you guys have any questions about uh, things that uh, you'd like us to talk about, please feel free to, you know, let us know in the comments. We're happy to chat. There's John's favorite subject, AR and VR. So ask him all the questions you want about that. No, please don't. Uh, this was on Paul Throt's blog, but I think um, you can probably find news about this all over the place. But Paul's a good source for the new things on Windows and .NET as well. Uh, they've shipped the final preview of .NET 8. Yeah, we're building up to .NET Conf, basically, where they'll ship .NET 8. So... So there, there will be another. It's it's not going to be a preview, but there'll be a release candidate next. Yes. So that would be the next thing on the radar, and then uh, the official launch in November, like you said at .NET Conf. And .NET Conf, uh, we should probably just mention it uh, real quick here. .NET Conf is uh, just been announced. I think it was announced a few days ago. It's going to be November fourteenth through sixteenth. And uh, this is not very well highlighted, but uh, oops, I keep hitting the wrong button here and knocking this off my screen. Um, I wanted to zoom in on this. There we go. Uh, the call for content is open. That is a link, by the way, that will take you to Sessionize, where you can submit a session if you think you'd like to speak at .NET Conf. So it is an open call for papers. So make sure you click there if you want to find that. That's at .NET Conf .net. It's a mouthful. Yeah, my mic is cutting in and out. It sucks. I'm sorry. Ooh. Uh, I've got to yeah, buy the AI. The AI is thing. filtering out Ed's uh, thoughts. There you go. I've never had luck with microphones on this system, so I'm going to have to try some new stuff and see what I can <laughs> manage. I, I've got something lined up I, I, in my... I'm going to dust off some old equipment that I think actually might work really well. So we'll try that next week and see how that works. I have a lot of recording to do. I'm working on some workshop stuff. And uh, I need to record some videos for it, so I'm definitely going to be fixing this issue. Hmm. But thanks for letting me know. Appreciate it. <laughs> AI will fix all the mic issues. I think AI is causing it somewhere, to be honest. I, I think there's some kind of filtering that keeps is that is that the new dog ate my homework the ai filtered out my voice yeah like i've got it all turned off and yet somehow something is in there fiddling with my my audio hmm. uh so yeah the final uh final dotnet previews out you can get that at the uh .NET website um download it check it out kick the tires i've got it on my system um it's not interfering with anything that i'm doing so side by side installation seems to be working really well yep let us know what you think. I'm running a Mac, so uh, yeah. It works there too. I know. It works there so. too. And I'm not going to judge you for using a Mac. Oh, come on. <laughs> not, not live on the air, but maybe, maybe a little bit. Uh, on top of that release, there's some new Go stuff, John. Go. Yeah, 1.21 1. 1. 1. has been released. So, um, it, it, you know, if you've done any work in Go, you'll know that this is sort of like, it's kind of like the uh, continual march. Some would call it a Batan death march, but, you know, it's like the continual release of software constantly keeping up. Um, so a variety of changes here, a uh, few changes around tooling, nothing major. Uh, language changes, which I think most people would find topical. So what Go, the Go team typically does is they tend to, uh, work on experimental features under an X um, module name, and then they release those as part of a sort of clear and concise um, package as, as part of that. So they have new built-in functions, min, max, and clear. These are 
you know, useful for uh, slices that you have in your, um, you know, your working set, you want to provide um, functions around that. Um, several improvements to type inference for generic functions. So this is often a, a challenge when working with types in Go. Um, inference can be a challenge. Everything kind of defaults to uh, an interface in Go, but uh, you can definitely leverage that. Um, they've got standard library editions as well. So new log and S log packages for structured logging, uh, a new slices package, which I've used. Um, these are awesome. Uh, the operations that are in there. So slices are like arrays. Um, they are basically a way in which you can iterate and uh, contain um, a collection of various things. And so the slices packages offers new operations so you can conduct against slices. Um, the the, the the amount of functions that are in there is is surprisingly i'm surprised that they were missing from v1 um they were definitely useful but those as i said were an experimental folder for a while and now they're official uh the maps package is another um one that i use quite a bit so maps are like a dictionary object uh so you have string value pairs etc that you can look up and so they have common operations that have been added there and then uh, a CMP package for comparing ordered values as well. So things that you can do there. Obviously, import, Im improved performance around uh, runtime, etc. And then a new port of to WASI, which I know you're probably keen on there, Ed. So new web experimental port. Yes, it's a web assembly interface, oh. system interface. So WASM is, uh, I guess, will be the the universal runtime. It will be as as Scott Hanselman has said historically, um, the uh, the runtime operating or the the programming language of the web or something as, as it refers to javascript i guess wazzy will be the runtime for the internet <laughs> at some point uh It'll assuming broad adoption html c sharp go and WebAssembly. maybe some you rest. think well there you go i don't know maybe. we'll see hmm. don't quote me on any of that all right all. all on our on our ar vr computers nice there we go that's the future uh resharper i think we both got this one this might show yeah. up yeah uh resharper yeah, yeah. 2023.2 new features they assisted predictive debugging mode that sounds crazy. yeah i like I like this one is a lot because the predictive debugger will highlight in different colors what uh what the what the host environment thinks will occur when you enable this so you have to opt in to the predictive debugger experience and once you turn this on it will provide syntax highlighting in terms of background color so um there are uh, if you take a look at the blog post that's listed there uh, they've got some screenshots listed um so they they talk a little bit about how like how it will operate when it's green it's basically like this is what the predictive debugger uh in expects if it's uh yellow it's it's something else and if it's red it's something else as well so I get the right uh, blog posts um yes there you go so there, there you go so yes so in this you can see um yellow is i believe executed you can see that it gives you um predictive values on the right hand side this is based on when you're in the breakpoint so you can see we're we're broke on i guess the while loop there um, and then you can see it will do um, the, the sort of like predictive values here as it's executing through steps. And then uh, depending upon the, the syntax highlighting, will give you different values. So red means it will not execute uh, those lines, I believe. So based on your current stat, your state, um, depending upon what's coming in. So uh, in this ex ex example, end is currently 957, I guess. So whatever. That's a nice that visualization. Means, I yeah. Yeah. Helps you understand where the code is executing. Like you can tell like this block and it's hitting this if statement down here. Um, I would probably refactor this and rewrite this so it didn't have so many branches, but that's on. Yes. It's, it's a matter of taste, but it's a great example. I'm not gonna pick the yes. demo. Code. So this is this is part of the debugger experience now with uh, with ReSharper. So something something to take a look at. Don't don't write code like this. In Oh, come on, Ed. Develop tools to do that. Ed, Ed, <laughs> have you seen the code that I've written? Come on. Uh, I write I write the most beautiful code, John. I use a pencil with no eraser. <laughs> <laughs> They're only happy uh, accidents. Uh, so uh, it was funny. I was using Gist earlier today. Yep. And uh, was it Gist or Fiddle? One of, the, one of these things, right? 
it, actually both. So just I was going back through time, like looking at some old samples, and I was like, ick, these are yep. really gross. And then I went back to like some .NET fiddles that I made on the like the REPL website. And I was like looking back and it's like, all right, 2015 is where I started hitting a stride. Like this is where I started coding better. It's really weird how you can see your skills change over time. But uh, some of my, the my skills don't change. Fiddling. The only thing that the only thing that changes with me at are the libraries that I reference. So my, my older <laughs> code examples are like you can see the you can see the you can it's like drilling through through uh, the ground. You can see like the layers of frameworks that I use. So oh that that's when I use Bootstrap. Oh that's when I use jQuery. Oh that's when I didn't use anything. <laughs> you know. I looked back and I was like, this is where I started writing functional C sharp, and that's where I think my code got really good. And uh, it was it was kind of cool to be able to see it in a timeline, uh, the way it was represented, like just all my saves i was just kind of scrolling through them uh so github speaking of gits and gists and all of that stuff uh github best practices for organizations and teams using github for enterprise cloud uh was this your link john or did i link this Grab I think you linked it, but um, this is basically. I, think I, I, I it for you though. This was something that was. Yeah. I was gonna love. <laughs> well, we use GitHub uh, quite a bit, and Enterprise Cloud is obviously uh, providing facilities for teams that are utilizing GitHub in a big way. If you want to get the primer on everything and anything relative to GitHub Enterprise, this would be a good article to start with. This basically goes from top to bottom. Um, in terms of what's what's available there, in terms of how to configure it, um, you know what you should consider when when getting this you know set up for your organization. A lot of folks utilize GitHub Enterprise for the capabilities that it provides. Um, allows you just basically provides you with segmentation across teams um, for your repos and setting up RBAC and setting up um, you know your workflows and actions and protections and code protections etc so there's lots and lots of stuff that you'll need to configure correctly if wanting to employ github across your organization and so github enterprise is a good solution for doing that i am i would be remiss if i didn't mention the fact that they mentioned devsecops right at the start and i think that's basically an homage to it's not an homage but it's certainly a head nod towards gitlab uh uh so i think that uh GitHub and GitLab are, are definitely, um, you know, um, you know, definitely duking it out, I think, for, uh, you know, a lot of stuff that's going on right now. So um, GitLab definitely promotes DevSecOps in a big way. It was never really a, a, a key. DevSecOps was never really a term utilized heavily by the folks over at GitHub, but they care about security a lot. I know this for a fact. They talk about security all the time, but they never use them. They never tend to use DevSecOps a lot in their messaging. GitLab does as an alternative. And so I think that okay. this is probably there, maybe in a response from a marketing perspective of, okay, we've got to compete a little bit better here because DevSecOps tends to resonate more with developers reading these types oh. of articles. For, for those who don't know what DevSecOps is, DevOps is basically the sort of, you know, the continual process of software engineering relative to coding and then deployment and then monitoring and then, you know, things that, that Mobius strip that you see. DevSecOps is basically with security layered across the entire spectrum um, with an emphasis towards shift left, which is basically this idea that when you shift left, you're pushing the facilities closer and closer to the developers. So the idea is if you take a spectrum from left to right, on the right is more automation, um, more systems in play, um, you know, things that are automated shift on the left are your developers who are building the code, etc. So shift left is pushing basically uh, concepts and, and primitives closer to where the developers are. So uh, a good example of this is like copilot copilot is definitely a shift left technology where you put the experience within Visual Studio code and you advise developers, hey, what you're writing here may not you know, be secure, for example, if, if looking at a security context. So anyways, this article here talks a little bit about, you know, what's available to you relative to GitHub Enterprise. It's a quite a, quite a detailed but lengthy read, and it's got some good visualizations in it. Um, they just wrote this, uh, you know, recently. This is a very recent post, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's very relevant. Um, yep. And uh, I thought not only you would be able to talk well to it, <laughs> folks here in chat would enjoy it so 
Yeah, certainly GitHub Enterprise is an interesting product. You can run it both the SaaS version and the on-prem version. So not a lot of people know, but you can actually run GitHub Enterprise on-premise. So if you're so inclined, you can uh, fire that up. All right. It's going to be a little shifting gears here, John. I like to get okay. down into the nitty gritty of things. Yes. Uh, this was a good read uh, as far as I'm concerned as a web developer. Uh, this is about the future of native HTML templating and data binding. Um, this, uh, this post is on Eisenberg Effect on Medium. Um, he's a big fan of uh, web standards, standards, as is I, as am I. I uh, can't speak today. I'm going to blame the microphone in Windows. Okay. Uh, so uh, the, there, there are a bunch of web standards already for things like web components, which yep. haven't gained a lot of traction, but is starting to seem like it's building uh, a little bit of momentum finally. Depends on who you talk to, yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's been out there like for a long time, but really hasn't got a foothold. And now people are starting to come around. Um, this is talking about um, another web standard, and that is for templating um, and the proposal for it. So uh, a lot of, you know, the usual uh, flavor of the week type of stuff going on in here with like which syntax is better. Uh, one framework does it with, you know, mustaches and another yes. one does it with double mustaches and so on. And trying to figure out like which one of these should we standardize on. Maybe we should just create another one because we can't standardize on anything. No, it's, uh, it, there's some proposals in here that um, that are interesting about, uh, you know, writing these to where they're familiar but don't clash with existing uh, web frameworks because that's another problem with these sure. typically typed things. Like you can't just go and adopt what framework A is doing because now when you try to run that through some sort of preprocessor, you get a clash between the two systems. So uh, there's this proposal to use like a double mustache dollar sign notation. Um, so I, I thought it was very interesting to see where this is going to go and if it gains yeah. a hold. These things don't. These things don't differ too much in terms of how they're used. I mean, the 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 hash denominator is 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 basically used for a reference value, and then the slash denotes an end of scope value. Um, so yeah. if you've done any programming, um, you'll get these terms pretty quickly. Um, and I think the challenge becomes sometimes when you're utilizing these in certain environments, like JSON, for example, like if you're if you've got you've got to escape everything now, <laughs> things like that. Um, this is this is a long-standing problem. This idea of templating your markup, um, it's actually driven people towards alternative solutions. But we've had solutions around this for like since forever, um, mm -hmm. and I don't think that I think this is a well-understood space. I think we just have to have agreement. I think that's what most people want out of this. So, and so Here's something that's going to be very interesting, though. As you said, you know, there's a lot of solutions around this already. There are. Mm. And there's some great ones out there. Um, you know, uh, Angular, React, uh, Blazor all do this very well. Blazor, uh, you know, I'm impartial to Blazor, but I, I still think they have the best uh, templating language because you don't have to define your end. You only have to define the start. I'm getting way ahead of myself, though. The real point of this is... Um, you know, you've got your template, you've got your result, but here's the real piece that makes this interesting, John. The browser would immediately, without running any JavaScript, yep. render the yep. HTML like this. This is inherent to HTML in the browser. Like mm -hmm. No JavaScript framework required, no JavaScript required. Well, something have, is running you have it. Data, Let's not kid ourselves. <laughs> you have your data, you have your form, and it binds. So, uh, yes, yeah, but I like, but it, it, it may not be JavaScript, but there is something running behind the scenes to process. There has to be, right? right so but there's not like a, I, um, imported this huge library of stuff. Yes, of course. Um, yes. This third party vendor, uh, that may or may not run Facebook. That's or, CPU bound. Yada, 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 <laughs> or yeah. Or Google. Yeah. Um, and yeah. This is, this is a web standard thing, and you can apply your data, and it will do this. So mm -hmm. this is very cool. Uh, there's also some stuff about signals, which borrows from Knockout, um, or not borrows, but uh, resembles Knockout, I guess. Yeah. 
um, which Steve Sanderson wrote in, you know, what, 2010, it says here. Uh, Steve, man, he's before his time on a lot of this stuff. Uh, <laughs> he's from the future, folks. Um, okay. But anyway, great read. Uh, like the Webstanders approach to the, the, the subject matter. And uh, can't wait to see what they do with that. Uh, with that, that said, web standards and all, there's been a lot of stuff going on in the CSS space. If you haven't been keeping your eye on it, there's a lot of specs for CSS that take forever to get folded into um, the actual implementation across all the browsers. Animations, uh, <laughs> excuse me. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So uh, <laughs> the the latest one to hit the you know all the browsers the that are widely accepted as like the browsers you know we're talking safari chrome edge um uh, Firefox. Safari what right sorry uh, i'm just being really sorry being did really, i say uh... ie oh no i did say <laughs> safari um no it, safari's starting to catch up a little bit it's not as bad as ie but it, it was getting there for some time right. anyway uh one of the newer features of css that has hit all of these browsers is color mix so you could take color a color b run it through an algorithm get color c out so you get red you get blue you put them together you get purple all right so that that is a new thing it's a new function that hit all of the, the browsers so what better to do than look at that um i i don't know if the author of this is going to see this hopefully not but uh, bob ross this is this is one of those things that um in my playbook is is called the because I could, but not because oh, I should. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, so uh, <laughs> the author writes, how to define an array of colors with CSS. And it's a complete and utter hack, but it is a brilliant hack, right? Um, it's very creative, very out of the box. I, I love what he did uh, with this. So um, the example he gives here is like, wouldn't it be cool if I could write, you know, these are my colors in an array. Sure. And you might not think this will work in modern CSS, but with a few extra steps, it does work. Um, so one example is uh, uses white and black in the in combination with the color mix function. Oh, I see. Now, the color mix function is required here because there's no way to index these two items. Uh, and so what he does is he hijacks the color mix function to mix these two colors you know, to 100% on either side of the spectrum uh, to get either the black or the white from it. So that's, you know, that's done here. It's, it's very interesting uh, the way it's done. Uh, then he goes on to say, well, if we did four colors, then we could use the linear gradient function. Yeah, yeah. Now we've got all of our colors in a palette. And if we got all of our colors in a palette and we span uh, across this much of the palette, then we have a 100% red and so on and so forth. So he's able to pick out the four colors out of the gradient and use them individually. So it's, it's very hacky. Um, it's very cool, though. And, uh, you know, props to the author for being able to kind of get around this mind-bending way to create an array within CSS colors. <laughs> I thought it was very clever um, and fun to read, even though it may not be something you want to put in your your actual code base. But for your hobby stuff, check it out. Uh, All right. Give it a try. I did not know about the color mix function. That's interesting. Color mix function is brand new. Uh, color mix, um, I did a show about this last week on uh, Blazor Power Hour and uh, showed how you can take the colors and run them through color mix. And does it support different uh, color schemes like HCL and uh, RGB? It does. And... Okay. So if you look at this color mix function here, the, mm. this is actually a keyword in. Uh, that doesn't change. So you say color mix in, and then this is the function that you want to run it through. Do you want right, it to be right, right. HSL function. Do you want it to be um, what's RGB, et cetera? And then you pass in the two colors and the percentages of those colors that you'd like to mix. We played around with this um, and got success in varying degrees um, on my show last week. What's nice is, at least in the white space of it, on an RGB scale, you could say, here's my brand color, and then you can get uh, five shades lighter, five shades darker. 
and we'll okay. use those for like you know this is my button then my hover color is five shades darker uh my disabled color is five shades lighter that type of thing instead of having to find all the colors individually i gotcha yep variables are a key to this can't do anything without those but uh it's it's great stuff uh, we're getting closer to the point where you don't need a preprocessor for CSS to be uh, <laughs> super successful these days. I've seen the mountain top. I may not get there with you. Yes. <laughs> That's a big thing, though. It's it's like uh, it's a maturity level CSS is finally reaching. Um, Google announces an AI browser-based uh, dev environment based on Visual Studio Code. I thought this was interesting, John. Um, so we've got Visual Studio Code, which was based on, what's it called, Monaco? Yes. Well, the, the text editor is codenamed Monaco. Yes. Yeah, so it was an open source project, but apparently this is uh, based on um, the VS Code uh, fork of it. So Project, uh, what's that second statement? So Project IDX is a browser-based development experience built on Google Cloud and powered by Code, Cody, a foundational AI model trained on code and built with Palm 2. Several so members, blah, blah, blah. It's designed to make it easier to build, manage, and deploy full-stack web and multi-platform applications with popular frameworks and languages. Project IDX is also built on Code OSS, so you should feel familiar no matter what you're building. Okay, uh, this means nothing to me. A lot of buzzwords <laughs> in there. So, yes. Um, I, I don't see... Oh, wait, here we go. Check it out at the... Oh, it's on. It's on a wait list right now. Um, so IDX.dev. Okay. To try it out, but uh, we ha we have various uh, coding uh, online coding features of uh, on the Microsoft side with like Visual Studio, uh, and maybe this is an answer to some of the stuff that they're doing. My guess is that so, they're touting this for Flutter. Flutter's their framework for building. Yeah, uh, mobile experiences. And this is probably a compete play against Maui. Um, to a certain extent, Maui and Copilot. And, I was going to say, Maui and... Um, what is it called? Code Spaces? Is that what it's called? Where uh, you've got your... Uh, we talked about it on the show a couple weeks ago. Microsoft's got like the uh, virtualization environment where you've got like your ID all set up, ready to go. Uh, jump right in to the cloud and, and just work on a VM type of a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, DevBox. a bit like that. And then, then they're putting some additional... Yeah, DevBox. Thank you. Um, it looks like they're putting some additional buzzwords behind it, like uh, okay. you know, AI with Cody and <laughs> the other one in here. Uh, Project IDX. And what does IDX stand Call for? Did, uh, did they heavy. did they even did they even mention what IDX is? I don't even know what it stands for. Integrated Browser development experience. Well. I don't know. That would be my guess. Work from anywhere. Like I mean, the idea of this is nice. Uh, yep. Here we go. So th this is a little more to what I was saying about them competing with the Microsoft stuff. Uh, every IDX workspace has the full capabilities of a Linux-based VM paired with universal access of the cloud. Which okay, is, so which this is, what this is a compete play. This is definitely a compete play. With DevBox. Yep, that's what it looks like to me anyway. So you've got and DevBox Copilot. that has and Copilot. Copilot, yeah. And yeah, this yeah. has gotcha. their version of Copilot, and it works with their infrastructure where Copilot probably, or I mean, um, DevBox probably works seamlessly with like uh, Azure stuff. You know what I mean? Yep. So I get it. Uh, it sounds interesting. And if you want to check it out, <laughs> you should sign up and. Uh, for a preview of it. Um, on to some more fun stuff, John. Uh, the, we're going to oh date God. ourselves. We're oh going to date ourselves here. QuakeCon 2023. Um, so this is returning after pandemic, finally. Uh, but what struck me here is this is the 25th QuakeCon. So if you're not familiar with what QuakeCon is, um, John, I think you are, but uh, for oh, the yeah. chat, if you're not familiar with what QuakeCon is, QuakeCon is a conference for Quake enthusiasts, developers, and, you know, um, like, uh, what do you call it? Like community. So, uh, you know, if you're 
playing quake based games or developing quake based games or uh doing you know some you know, level design for a quake based game you get it the idea uh they also do like tournaments and things like the quake world championships and the bring your own pc uh land parties that uh initially started with this um so it's it's a very much a nerd fest and um if i could get to one i'd probably go so uh, this is the 20 25 years though can you believe this has been 25 years and that's just quake cons i don't know when the first quake con started after the quake release but oh everyone had land quake. parties back in the day believe me yeah so yeah that's that's a thing and it's like three days long let's see to, uh from today through the 13th <clears throat> so hey check it out if you're in that neck of the woods but um it's being live streamed on twitch so there's paired programming so uh it's not just a gaming thing like i said there's a lot of software development involved in this i used to develop uh, uh levels for a quake based game back in the day so uh, i'd fit right in nicely there uh and then uh, last thing is just a shout out to, and I think I lost. God. Uh, I lost the thing that I was supposed to be on. This is it. Um, so Pistol Whip. Uh, I'm just a big fan of the game. It's a lot of fun. It's a super fun game, John. It's in VR. Got to have a quest to play it. Sorry, I know. I really want one, but haven't gone out and bought one yet. Um just an insanely fun game and one of the things i like about the folks that uh create this game is they they don't have the like the new model of like subscription based like monthly payment type stuff you bought the game they come up with the updates for it and if you own the game you get the updates you don't have to pay for it again um it's one of my favorite games on my quest and they are launching uh, a new um, single-player campaign for it called Overdrive Majesty, which is a... Um, I'm trying to find the right picture there. Okay, so it's got, uh, like, medieval tones to it, like uh, crossbows and sword fights and things like that. It's an and, amazing, and, appara like, and apparently yeah. guns. <laughs> well, Pistol Whip is uh, originally designed as a shooter, um, and it's, it's kind of like... Um, Hogan's Alley meets VR meets, um, what's that, uh, Guitar Hero. Okay. Okay. So merge those three to have, uh, together in your head. So it's it's one of those rhythm-based games, uh, but you have a pistol and there's, you know, targets, robots, enemies, was, aliens, things that pop up. I was thinking more you. Army of Darkness type motif, <laughs> you know. Uh, it's an insanely fun game. Um, it, it is a very active game. So like, this is going to give you some cardio. Like you're not going to just be sitting around trying to play this. You're, you're going to break a sweat trying to do this game. Um, it's a lot of fun. All and right. like I said, you buy it and they release updates for it per, like seasonally and you don't have to buy it again. It's not like a, a buy the season pass type of thing. Like these guys are doing this... old school absolutely this lovely. looks this looks like a caesar inducing nightmare to me but there you go um if you have uh epilepsy i would not recommend this uh, no I'll talk to your doctor before trying that out a lot um, of flashy stuff there i think i get a headache um it's it's a pretty intense game i love it though it's like it's great said, it's good activity and i'm glad that you love it if you love you, it then i love it gets you up and moving gets you off your rear end and uh, gets you gaming and uh in an active way it's a lot of fun it's challenging um so yeah it's one of one of the one of my highest rated personally wow my highest rated games on wow quest. there you go so if you have a quest want a quest grab your grab pistol whip i think it's like probably less than 30 bucks these days give it a try the new stuff new content's coming it's coming oh it's out now I need, I need to boot that up this afternoon and try it out. <laughs> That's all I've got, John. All right. I have for today, my friend. We managed to keep it to an hour. Uh, Very good. Well, I lost the audience with the VR stuff again. Uh, not going to apologize. It's going to happen someday. 
someday, John. You know, you got a you got the headset and everything, but you need a you need a microphone. That's the that's the one thing you really need there, bud. So you say that, but ironically, when I was doing <laughs> uh, VR shows on Codet Live, my Oculus headset had a better microphone than the Yeti that I use. Everybody always said like the the quality of the audio went up a notch when I put my okay. headset on. Isn't Interesting. That weird? So whatever they're using for a microphone in that thing is really good. Mm. Um, no joke. I'm not trying to put one over on you. Like we would always get people in chat going, your, your audio is so much better when you, when you have the VR headset on. Maybe, maybe this should be a thing for you. Maybe it's telling you something. You should just wear your headset all the time. Yeah, I, next show, John, don't tempt me. Please, you're gonna have please to, do. You're going to be the one having to look at me on camera. Please, please wear it. I want you to wear it. I'll do it. I'll do it <laughs> next show. It's, uh, I need to get it out and hook it to my computer anyway. All right, John. Thank you for joining me again, and uh, no see you all next week.